Hi, everyone. Good morning. And thanks so much for stopping by to chat with me today about OSHA common COVID-19 related citations, strategies, and resources for compliance. I'm Doria Cipriani. Uh, by the way, nice to meet you all. And um, away we go. And I apologize in advance for any technical difficulties. Uh, objectives. So today we're going to talk about what is OSHA, what does it do, frequently cited standards related to COVID-19 inspections, and talk about uh, action plans, tools, and resources for compliance uh, to help us all stay compliant. So OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, OSHA is a uh, part of the U.S. Department of Labor and it was formed by Act of Congress in 1970. And you know, OSHA's goal, it's really a terrific goal, is to ensure uh, safe and healthy, healthful working conditions for workers. And, and how does it do this? It, it sets and enforces standards, uh, lots of standards. Um, and they do this uh, along with lots of great support. They provide training, outreach, um, education, uh, and assistance. So uh, in our industry, we're all very familiar with the um, survey cycle, the accreditation cycle and survey cycle um, and standards. And many of us are familiar with organizations or AOs such as the Joint Commission, AAAHC, or say Quad ASF. And depending on the type of survey you sign up for, we know when they're coming in the door uh, or we don't know. And, and Oftentimes they'll come in, they'll look under the covers, and sometimes um, we, we, we get citations. And the usual plan is to do your plan of correction, uh, and hopefully you meet all your goals and you successfully make it through to your next survey cycle. So OSHA 2 will, will do a survey or an inspection, um, but what's a bit different about OSHA is that they will issue financial penalties for citations. and um, you know, annually OSHA puts out a list of its most common uh, frequently cited standards. And this year, the 2021 list, as it relates to standard citations relating to coronavirus, January's list evidenced that over $4 million had been issued in response to those standard citations. And, you know, um, it, no one wants to pay that large sum of money and OSHA goes one step further. If you're issued a, a citation for a standard violation and you don't mitigate that or fix that, uh, correct that citation, that they'll issue you perhaps daily citations up to $13,000. So um, we don't really want uh, OSHA coming in the door for an inspection. And, and Doria, why would they come in my door, you ask? Well, they could potentially come in your door if, say, a staff member makes a claim or if there is a, um, a really significant, serious event relating to a staff member. If, let's say, uh, perhaps it might be an unfortunate death or loss of an eye or loss of a limb, you know, they're coming in your door. Or they perhaps might re receive a referral from a local agency, a local Department of Health, or perhaps one of those other AOs that I mentioned. So. Um, that's how OSHA steps through its issuance of, of standard violations. So the, we're going to talk today about uh, four common frequently cited standards related to COVID-19 inspections, the respiratory protection, personal protective equipment, record keeping, and the general duty clause. So you'll be receiving a copy of the slide deck, I understand, and I have hyperlinked below. Uh, if you uh, click on that hyperlink, and I do encourage you to go to the OSHA website, it's incredibly resourceful, it's comprehensive, and once you figure out how to navigate that website, you're going to find what you're looking for from OSHA, um, because they really uh, do a really good job in providing us resources and tools. And that hyperlink will take you to um, an outline of the common COVID-19 citations, and they, they tell you what the standard is, they cite the, uh, the standard or the citation and along to the right, they provide to you uh, the helpful tools. They'll give you the tool if you need a document um, or oftentimes some of the hyperlinks there will take you directly to a YouTube video 
um, an OSHA YouTube video and it just walks you through what you need to do to, um, to get compliant. For the respiratory uh, protection program, what they cited was lack of having a, a written respiratory protection program, not having a medical evaluation to determine the employee's ability to use a respirator, uh, not having a uh, evaluation of the respiratory hazards in the workplace, and probably the biggest one is lack of a fit test. So, um, you know, a respiratory protection program in the hospital space is, you know, very common to, their, to who they are in their space and is, um, you know, a reflection of all the very many potential respiratory hazards that might be available um, in, or might be present in a hospital. You know, in the ASC world, ASCs had to come up very, very quickly in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so mostly in part, largely in part by now, um, whoops, I'm sorry, folks, some, get rid of that. You see that little email message there. So on the screen there, you'll see, um, for those of you, however you learn, if you learn by list or learn by the more visual, there's um, a breakdown of the respiratory protection standard and all of its components. This is a big uh, program, the written respiratory uh, program, rather, I meant to say, um, with all of its components. And we'll talk a little bit about each of them today. And like I mentioned, that the respiratory protection program is, is um, very common in the hospital space. If you go on the, uh, the hyperlink that was on the prior page, the OSHA website will provide you a very long document, 100 pages plus, that is for the hospital, which you can very easily uh, customize and use it in a ASC space. So to get your uh, program off the ground, uh, and I'm hoping just saying that by now, um, respiratory protection program should be either well-established in, in, in your healthcare facility or um, just needing a little bit more polish to button it up. But you wanna be sure that you have a program administrator in place and that person is often the director of operations or the administrator, and they're the person that has the responsibility for the overall compliance for the program. They're certainly not running around doing all the multiple tasks, but they're delegating to the appropriate people to be sure that um, all the components of the program are met. The program has to be rooted in understanding what the hazards are, the respiratory hazards are within your, within your space. And, and, um, the environment of coronavirus, we heard a lot about, um, you know, assessing the procedures performed in your space and particularly about airborne generating procedures. Uh, and these are conversations that should be occurring internally within your infection control committee or quality committee and in consultation with, say, your infection control consultant. And, and then you want to identify what the hazards are in your uh, facility. to, you know, uh, the various components of PPE that will be used to, uh, you know, keep our healthcare staff safe. Uh, primarily for the respiratory protection, uh, we have been uh, hearing all about respirator use. Uh, respirators used in an ASC space are not as common as it had been in a hospital space. Those of us who might have um, spent time in a hospital, uh, not only the direct patient care areas, but other areas in the hospital, uh, the use of respirator is not uncommon, as well as the fit testing and you know, filling out the paperwork to ensure that um, any end user would be appropriately appropriate to wear a respirator. So NIOSH certified, so uh, NIOSH National uh, Institute of um, Safety and Health would be the organization that certifies respirators. You want to be sure whatever respirators you're using that NIOSH approved is NIOSH certified rather is stamped prominently on your respirator. There was uh, early on in the pandemic, um, probably now uh, 2020, spring of 2020, um, we saw the arrival of KN95s onto the market and we all kind of, I believe, breathed a collective sigh of relief because we were in dire straits with the PPE supply chain, including respirators. But in short order, it was determined that KN95s were not um, 
of equal uh, efficacy for the same level of protection that the uh, NIOSH certified respirator afforded. You just want to be sure whatever respirator you're using, it's NIOSH certified. The picture there shows some types of respirators, uh, N95s, type fitting respirators. And there's also the PAP, PAP, PAPR, excuse me, uh, powered air purifying respirator. And those are the kind of spaceman looking with the hood and may not see them in a single specialty um, surgical center, but you might see those in a, a large scale, larger uh, healthcare facility, hospital system perhaps. Um, prior to um, the use of a respirator, all end users, everybody, staff, uh, contract personnel, anesthesia providers, physicians and surgeons, they need to have a, a medical evaluation in their personnel file for uh, OSHA clearance to use a, a respirator. Uh, there's, there's a hyperlink there where OSHA just gives you the tool, just I encourage you to just print it, download it, print it, and give it to all of your end users to complete. This can be completed um, perhaps by a registered nurse inside, you know, in your facility, perhaps your director of nursing. There's some training um, online for that. There is a few questions in that questionnaire that would trigger perhaps a referral to a physician as needed. But it is an OSHA requirement that all end users have a um, clearance document to use a respirator in their file. Fit testing. So here's the big one. Here's the one that um, a year ago, we couldn't get fit testing supplies. We couldn't get the masks. We couldn't get the supplies. Um, fit testing is required initially before use and annual, annually. The uh, annual requirement for fit testing never went away. OSHA had recognized the, the dire straits that, that the world was in as relates to getting PPE and supplies. And their surveyors were trained to kind of review the respiratory program and just to kind of uh, be sure that facilities were doing their due diligence to roll the program out as best as they could. Uh, we have come a long way since then. PPE supply chains have opened up. Fit, fit testing supplies are readily available. So you really need to be sure that you are uh, having a initial and annual fit testing performed. And be sure that whatever you're fit testing, it's the actual mask that folks are, actual respirator that folks are using. That fit testing document should live in, in the individual's medical file. If there's a change in, in, in the person's um, body habits, if they gain a lot of weight, lose a lot of weight, that fit testing should be repeated. Uh, so respirator use. Uh, when, when are you going to wear the respirator? who's wearing it when um, and where in your facility. So these kinds of conversations should be occurring within your infection control committee, perhaps in consultation with your infection control consultant. Um, during, the, during the time in the, in the pandemic where the CDC and the FDA, they were supporting crisis strategies at the heart of the crisis, the CDC and the FDA, they, they were, um, supporting, if you will, or okaying crisis strategy, strategies. And some of the strategies that were implemented were, as relates to the respirator, were extended use or reuse of the mask. So um, fortunately, we're in a, a much better place, incredibly better place. We have the supplies, we have the materials that we need. And for months now, uh, uh, CDC, FDA, they have put out very clear guidance documents that the recommendation is to return to, or we should be returning to conventional strategies. Crisis strategies are no longer um, warranted. And you just wanna be sure that you are current with all of the guidance and reviewing your processes in your center to be sure that you're using conventional strategies uh, as it relates to the use of respirators. In, in an environment of crisis strategy, which we're not in any longer, you still would wanna be sure that your team knows how to clean and maintain uh, their, their respirator. They wanna just be, incorporate that in your training, that their 
uh, knowing how to inspect the mask or, or understand, you know, what is that manufacturer's instructions for you? So you just want to be sure that incorporate in part of your training. When, when you do train your team on the overall respiratory program, it should be everyone because everyone has to, you know, be kept safe and understand the program that's in your facility. So that, that everyone includes your, your providers and your staff, both clinical and non-clinical staff. You wanna be sure they're aware of the program, what are the policies that, what they should be uh, expecting of as it relates to completing a medical questionnaire and to receive fit testing, that they know how to put a respirator on and take it off and that they're aware to report any, any um, ill-fitting masks. That's really important that they let you know if their mask is not fitting them properly. And they should learn how to do a seal check even after they've had a, a fit testing performed. Um, if there's any significant changes to the program, um, case in point where if you had uh, instituted your program under crisis strategies, now that we're back to conventional, conventional strategies, you would have uh, wanted to have re-educated your staff and capture that, uh, uh, document that on an in-service sheet and be sure you have a record of that re-education. And, and as always, you want to do some annual training on the program. Speak, uh, so program, this is a, a really big program, so you might want to think about it as uh, your infection control program or your, say, your um, in emergency preparedness program. So you always want to really understand how your programs are doing. So evaluation of it. Um, OSHA, you recall that document, that blue document earlier from the hospital uh, template toolkit for the respiratory protection program. You go into that document, scroll on down to Appendix C. OSHA has provided you within that document a program evaluation tool. I think it's a one pager. It might be a one and a half pager. Um, and just, I would recommend to just use it. You know, you can include your staff, hand it out to some of your select staff or all of your staff perhaps, and some providers and get the feedback on, on how they feel about the program and, and do a high level uh, summary evaluation and tuck it in your infection control binder, run it through your copy committee and then up to the board for approval. So you've gotten um, really strong documentation there on annual review of your uh, program. Uh, record keeping. So all these pieces of paper we're pushing around, the fit testing and the, and the uh, medical clearance, those have to be retained just pretty much forever in a person's medical file. Um, you want to be sure that you have a, uh, you want to be sure you know if you update your program Let me start over. Let's, for example, let's say you have a claim by a staff member. You want to be able to produce the program document or policy that was in place at any given time. So when you have your program, if you make a change or you update it, you know, you do a save as and save it with the new date. Short version is just be sure you know what policy and program were, uh, was in place at any given time. Uh, do an annual uh, approval of your program, as I said, and, and just save all your documents and be sure they're readily available for your staff. Personal protective equipment uh, was another standard frequently cited, and citations were issued for not having a hazard assessment, um, not having policies when PPE must be provided, training of employees was not apparent on the PPE use and selection of PPE to be used against a hazard identified. So it's great to see um, an image of someone in full PPE, happily or luckily for us, it's available again on PPE. Um, this is a, a, an image that is reminiscent of some years ago when a, Ebola hit the scene and, and we had many uh, staff training days of donning and doffing. So this is a very familiar image and um, not often seen in perhaps a single, single specialty uh, ambulatory surgery center, but all too frequent uh, 
frequently we see it now in most of our healthcare spaces. PPE program, so uh, not unlike the respiratory protection program, to really understand what are your hazards um, before you can implement any uh, policy. So uh, workplace hazards and engineering, engineering control assessment can be done and that will identify your hazards along with what are the controls, i.e. You know, what, what are the PPE, uh, what is the PPE that should be worn for any particular task. You can identify um, the response to the workplace hazards assessment and create policies on, on um, you know, what is the policy, on um, what types of PPE will be worn in throughout your organization. And it's not necessarily PPE only worn in, say, a direct patient care area or in clinical space. You want to make an assessment from door to door um, due to the environment that we're in. You want to be sure even your folks at the non-clinical staff who are perhaps registering folks or meeting and greeting folks at their um, patients at their uh, protected as well. Uh, no one ever told me, boy, do we hear that a lot, right? So you want to be sure that you have all of your training uh, documented, clearly documented, attendance sheets clearly signed off on. So everyone's on the same page about what they should be doing uh, in your facility as it relates to PPE. Um, you know, initially on hire and then always annually, anytime there's significant changes in between your program. Uh, evaluation of your PPE use. Um, some ways that you can do that is uh, using your infection control surveillance audits. You, you should be assessing PPE, um, you know, a couple of times throughout the year, you, you know, uh, ensuring that, that your staff is following the process, processes and the policies that um, have been put in place for their own protection. Um, and it's, it's helpful to switch up where those audits are performed. You can just do them throughout your center and your care areas, care areas or your, your uh, non-clinical areas and even including in your reprocessing rooms. Another way to assess how your PPE program is faring is to take a look at your incident reports, uh, including your exposure incidents. If you see a trend in a particular type of incident, it, you might want to really consider uh, what PPE is being used and how it's being used. So record keeping. Um, you know, OSHA has lots of compliance tools, but they also have a lot of um, reporting requirements. I'm just going to skip to the, the next slide. So in 2017, um, there was a final rule which amended some of the reporting requirements for, for ASC space. Hospitals have a higher reporting uh, requirement for OSHA. Um, the one that I think is probably most common to everyone is the 300A form that uh, it's a summary of any in illness or, or work-related injuries from the prior year. So that gets hung and mostly everyone puts it in their kitchen or their staff lounge from February to April. So that's something that most folks are probably familiar with. Um, you know, OSHA has a 301 and a 300 log, which can capture um, incidences that certainly anyone can just use those particular tools if they'd like. But the, re the reporting requirement to OSHA for those uh, no longer applies to the ASC. There are required reporting uh, for all healthcare facilities, certain events uh, such as if there was a death or a loss of a limb or a loss of an eye, those are all required for uh, reporting to OSHA by all uh, employers. So I, uh, I know all of us in the room wear many hats throughout the course of the day. And my guess is today everyone has their OSHA hat on. So I'll say just for a moment, take your OSHA hat off and put your human resources hat on. So the human resources uh, hat that we wear tells us that we're all aware of that phrase that's in most job, description, job descriptions that read, and, and any other duty as a sign. 
Okay, so put your OSHA hat back on. So OSHA has a very similar um, sentiment, if you will, and they call it their general duty clause. It's kind of like their um, other duties as assigned, where if there is an opportunity where there is something that can be cited, now there's some components for the general duty clause, it has to be a known hazard with um, some known uh, corrective actions that could help avoid the hazard. And it has to be uh, something that is known to cause harm to the worker. Using the coronavirus as an example, um, OSHA did not have standards specific to the coronavirus. They frequently would cite the general duty clause. Um, for example, they knew that coronavirus was a, uh, a hazard known to cause uh, harm to the worker. And there were some known uh, corrective actions such as social distancing, protective, since social distancing, uh, protective barriers, masks, et cetera. Excuse me. If they came upon an environment that had none of those um, corrective actions in place, they would cite the general duty clause. Now, just for, just for the spirit of trying to keep things current and providing you current information, in as many months, OSHA has, um, you probably have heard of the ETS, the um, uh, Emergency Temporary Standard. I'm not gonna talk about it at, at, at length today at all, but I will share with you, but OSHA recognized that their general duty clause maybe wasn't sufficient enough to address the coronavirus pandemic. So, um, as it relates to the OSHA ETS, you might want to be having conversations with perhaps your infection control coordinator within your own organization, your quality committee, and perhaps your own legal counsel to just better understand if that ETS applies to your setting. There is some gray um, within the language of it, so you just need to understand if your particular setting uh, is any applicability in your particular setting. So resources, um, OSHA gives us a lot of help. We have to find it sometimes, but um, it's all readily available. So I actually might have um, grabbed this uh, compliance checklist from OR Manager. We have very briefly today spoken about four OSHA standards. OSHA has many, many, many more that it could potentially be an eight hour day to chat about. But um, if you, if in an ASC space, if you want to take a little look under your own covers and see how compliant you are, you can download um, an, an OSHA compliance checklist. This is just the first page to kind of give you an example of what it looks like. You can do a little self, uh, you know, self inspection to see how you're doing with, excuse me, the OSHA standards. OSHA has a interesting program available across the country in all the states um, that where it's their, it's their on-site consultation program and they will come into your facility, call them in, and it's no cost, it's confidential, they will not issue citations and they'll give you some um, consultation and feedback to identify standards and how to perhaps correct them. The New York office um, contact information is here. If you go on to the OSHA website, you can sign up to receive what they call quick takes. Um, if you want more things coming across your phone, you can choose to get them on your phone or you can get them onto your email. And uh, you choose the industry that you like, frequency of how often you want them to come. And, and there, I've done it and I found them to be helpful. Some of them I just kind of swipe on by, but some of them I actually stop and read. And it's an opportunity to get you uh, kind of with your finger on the pulse on what's happening uh, with OSHA. With some references. Thank you very much for your time today.